Thank you, and thank you for the introduction. It's very nice to hear you, Antoine, and to see all of you, and congratulations to all the organizational team that does this amazing job in terms of logistics. Uh, it, it does feel close to you, even if I couldn't go this time in person. And I hope the dogs, they are also doing very well. I do miss all of the colleagues, but the dogs, they are so friendly that I miss being there to pet them. So they are very, very beautiful. So let's get going and uh, thank you for the invitation to speak about this. I'll be presenting some of the work that the FAO has been doing over the past months. I joined FAO about three months ago, so I'll be presenting uh, the work that was done in the recent past and above all, the work that we are planning for the, the next five years. And uh, this plan, this work, it will be mostly part of the, the under this umbrella of the new action plan that we have at FAO for the next four or five years. So 2021 to 2025. And then I don't think that now that you are in the third day of the course, um, any of these keywords will be surprising to you. Some of the objectives focus on good practice and awareness and responsible use, governance, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So these are the five objectives of the, the new action plan of FAO and uh, much of our work will be done under this umbrella. Now, by now we are becoming all close to experts on AMR and I do think it's it's uh, really exciting and fascinating to work on AMR because of the, the integration of all of these things. So we, we all have seen different diagrams putting these pieces together of, uh, and you can make a million errors doing this, that in, in fact, all of our actions are interrelated and more and more and more we are aware of this. So the, and to, to me, since I like policy a lot, during my PhD, I did some work on uh, public policy. I do think many of our work leads uh, uh, to policy making. And then uh, we do need to be aware that uh, a policy is usually just a piece of paper. It's a beautiful PDF, but if not implemented and enforced, then uh, it's not that powerful. But uh, the, much of the work that we are doing now is uh, moving to implementation and actions. Uh, based on this policy as much as possible, evidence-based policies. So this is just a slide to show this integration of all the, the different components. Now, uh, Antoine said, oh, this is a One Health uh, presentation, and I do strongly believe uh, that, uh, that we, we do always need to have this very, very clear in mind. AMR is the perfect example of a One Health issue. Lately, I've also been feeling that uh, we, we need to be careful of not overusing it, the concept. And uh, uh, again, uh, by no means, I, I'm a strong believer on it. And but there's two things that I've been realizing. We can't overuse it. I think over is like you overusing antimicrobials. If we overuse them, then it's never a good sign. So overusing One Health, we need to be careful to keep sure that we keep using it in the proper way. And also, uh, uh, under this umbrella, we shouldn't keep uh, a loose track of the responsibility or accountability of each of the sectors that are part of this one uh, umbrella of One Health. Sometimes I think if any of us was nominated tomorrow, the One Health Minister of a new country, I wonder if we knew where to start from. If we were the ministers of health, we, I guess we had some idea. If we were the ministers of agriculture, we also had some idea who to interact with, where to start. But uh, the One Health is a very, very big umbrella so, uh, and, and that's the beauty of working on, on it, that we, we are now more and more embracing the concept, um, but we shouldn't lose track of the accountability of each of the sectors that contribute to this um, global One Health. And when we speak about One Health and or health, One Health on and um, antimicrobial resistance, to oversimplifying it, I, as, as Antoine said, I started my career as a clinician, and I still think as a clinician, and the, the, my the beginning of my interest on antibiotics or anti initial antibiotics and then antimicrobials was the frustration of treating sick animals and not being able to be successful leading to the the pain or the death of the animal and the frustration of dealing with the client the human client that uh, looked at me like if i couldn't treat the the animal so that was initially i started thinking about antibiotics infectious diseases bacterial diseases and that was my my way of thought. And then a few years ago, I went to a conference and the privilege of going to a conference in Hong Kong, where there was this work presented on antidepressants. And basically, I went to the speaker at the end, I was too shy to ask in the, in the plenary room, but at the end I asked, so can we say that the use of antidepressants can lead to antimicrobial resistance? And the, the, answer, the short answer is yes, and I'm not a microbiologist, so I'm sure that the molecular biology of this is quite complex. But I do think this is fascinating because it means that 
uh, any initiative, any policy that leads to well-being of human beings, and well-being is again a, a broad concept, but we, I think we, we have some understanding of this as a staff members, for example, what we intend by well-being. So if this leads to well-being and therefore the avoidance of using antidepressants, we are also contributing to controlling AMR. And this is a good example of the, the, the power of One Health. But again, I don't think many policymakers or, uh, or the ones, a mayor of a city, the uh, CEOs of companies are aware of this. And I think it is important that we spread these uh, messages and the, the, the overall power of some of the measures that sometimes we are not even aware of. And then I think we, we, we are spe speaking in the, in the, 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 and the, the, the initiative of a medical foundation. Um, and some of you, uh, I think, are medical doctors, some veterinarians, etc. I saw the profiles, very interesting. And I think we struggle with this. We speak about AMR frequently now, and uh, we, we, we know the concept, but it's super tricky to explain what is the incubation period of AMR. We are familiar with the concept of incubation of infectious diseases, and we know that it can be very different from hours to years in paratuberculosis, in cattle, for example. But if you want to explain what is the incubation period of AMR, it might be forever or never. We might get an AMR gene, but never express that resistance. And I think as these courses, these meetings are super useful to have the opportunity to learn for each other. How can we explain this to a consumer that there is a risk, even if it might, might never, he or she might never express it? And as a scientific community, we need to discuss and learn from each other. How can we explain this to a person that there is a risk but there is the incubation period, we don't even know when it will be expressed. And in times of COVID, for example, when the risk was so discussed, and it seems like next to us, the person ne sitting next to us in a meeting room, for example, in a restaurant or in a, tra in a trip, these, these things are tricky to explain. And that's why we need to discuss them among ourselves and learn how the best way to, to explain them. And the FAO, I, I think all of us are familiar with the, the Sustainable Development Goals. And uh, again, initially, I think that the, the first thought is about associating antimicrobials with health, health, uh, the one health, humans, animals, environment, plants, etc. But if you look, there are 17 sustainable development goals. And in reality, you can easily connect the use and availability or the efficacy of antimicrobials to nine of the 17 uh, substandard development goals, or even further, but at least nine. So I guess, I guess the, the, the the, the, the broad, how broad it is, the concept of the availability and efficacy of antimicrobials is, is really always surprising to me. And we always have these numbers. Uh, um, and again, like the numbers I use, the, the, these predictions uh, are, I think, useful to give us an order of magnitude. And it's always, it has always many zeros of, uh, in terms of econ economic costs and the number of deaf people. So these numbers are useful for this to raise awareness and to, to give us, a, even if they will not be fully correct, um, they give us a, a magnitude of the dimension of the, the issue that we are dealing with. Now, I joined at the FAO, I'm um, uh, working with the, the food safety division. And uh, so I think all of us, if we speak about climate change of climate crisis, I think that's the most appropriate uh, terminology at the moment, climate crisis. And if you think about food security, I think that this, all of us could relate to it, that uh, the, the food security and the climate crisis were related. I think there's less uh, uh, attention paid to food safety and the climate crisis, and even less to the, the connection between climate crisis and AMR. And this is linked, for example, with the, the different epidemiology or the patterns of disease that we have, and the availability of clean water, for example, for infection and prevention and control, or by security measures. So again, that's why it's so technically so interesting and fascinating to work on AMR, because this is another connection that I think most of us, until recently, at least uh, in a broad sense, were not expressing the concern between AMR and the climate crisis. So I think instead of further developing myself, we have a video that explains this. Let's see if it works well, and then we'll proceed with the slides.
Okay, so we can reassume, uh, resume now. And I think this is the, uh, one of the, I think all of us struggle with this. How do you um, explain this concept of a global public good or common good that we need to preserve? I always say that none of us wakes up in the morning thinking, oh, great, I have 30 classes of antimicrobials at my, antibiotics at my disposal. So therefore, I should be first super excited about it and should treat them uh, with all the, the, the care about it. I don't think that that happens to any of us. And in fact, we should. And it's, it's a concept very hard to, to, to explain to, to younger generation, for example, even if the younger generation seem to be very aware of the climate crisis. And that might be, uh, we might use it in our benefit, the AMR community. Like if you connect the dots, maybe we, we raise uh, further attention from the younger generations. All right, so let's see. Let me stop. Maybe I need to stop sharing to move on for the next slide. Just a sec. Share again. Ah. Yeah. All right. All right, so moving on on the, the, some of the interventions that we have been doing at FAO on the, um, at the agriculture level, both on AMR and antimicrobial use uh, surveillance and interventions at the field. One of them, maybe some of you in the room have been involved with the, the Fleming Fund, what we call the Fleming Fund project. This is the, 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 the full name of the project is this, engaging the food and agriculture sectors in South Africa and Africa and Southeast Asia in the global efforts to combat antimicrobial resistance using a one health approach. So this is a, 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 my colleague Emmanuel and a colleagues Emmanuel and Carolina are the ones leading it. And again, some of you might be uh, involved with it, some of the countries that have been involved in this project. And I will refer to both of them as they are the ones leading mostly uh, directly with this project. There's uh, 12 countries, so mostly from two main regions, and it, it will be expanded until uh, next year, I believe. And uh, it has been contributing to all of these things that we discussed, usually the, the, the global action plan, the FAO action plan, the, the objectives are not that different, even if we use sometimes different words, but it has led to this the capacity building, the, the application of good principles, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm not getting to the details. I'll refer to you to my colleagues, Emmanuel or Carolina, but it is a good example of uh, interventions at the agricultural level that led to capacity building, for example. Also a note on the codex work. Uh, so food safety is highly related with the, uh, um, the codex alimentary work. And I think most of you, I don't know if, if you covered this in the course or not yet, uh, the work that the task force on AMR hosted by the Republic of Korea did on uh, the code of practice to minimize and contain AMR and then the guidelines on integrated and uh, monitoring and surveillance of foodborne. So this is codex work on foodborne um, AMR. So the, about two weeks ago, the task force was concluded with the, the development of these two documents that I think will guide many of our future work. And the Codex Elementaris Commission will meet next week to uh, finalize the codex process, leading to the adoption and the implementation of these projects. And again, on interventions, the, the Republic of Korea donated $10 million uh, to implement these uh, standards in six different countries initially. So that's something that uh, I will be directly very involved, making sure that as much as possible, we do implement these new standards in six uh, uh, um, countries for the next five years. Then on data and the speaking about standards, I always like to highlight this, that we, the, 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 sometimes there's gaps that I, I, I find them fascinating because we do these presentations on AMR, we have all these courses on AMR, we present these uh, semi-apocalyptic numbers of the number of death, economic costs, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But at the end, when we dig, we find, for example, there's a lack of clinical breakpoints for bacterial animal pathogens which means that we don't even speak the same language defining these bacteria, this veterinary or animal bacteria is resistant or not. So we, we have a, a lack of these clinical breakpoints at the moment. And we also they have different interpretation criteria, namely the clinic uh, CLSI versus EUCAS, one more American, one more European, and the clinical breakpoints versus the epidemiological ones. So the key word here is different. None of them is right or wrong, but they are different. And sometimes this leads to struggle in the comparison over the results. So um, there's, there's groups working on this, 
luckily. Uh, the the Innovat is is a group, uh, uh, European network working on this. That I always like to acknowledge their work. Many of you might be also working, and this is something that we at FO are uh, interested in keep working. So the, if any of you has projects in this field, is working on this, is, has some ideas on working on this, we'll be happy to hear from you to see how we can further progress on this, um, to, to, to fill in these gaps. Then in terms of databases, uh, I'm sure Delphi, from my, my colleague from OIE, um, made a, a presentation on the antimicrobial use database that OIE has been developing and, and the whole the process of transitioning from collecting data from Excel spreadsheets um, to the database now that is under development. WHO, my colleagues from WHO at some point presented the glass work and the reports that they have and the FAO we are developing the infarm which is a new uh, platform that will collect uh, data mostly of AMR, so very clearly OIE has been collecting data on antimicrobial use in animals, and FAO will collect the AMR data and the MU specifically in plants or crops, so there's no overlap between the, the they complement uh, the, the, the work of OIE and FAO, complement each other without overlapping. And so this is the name of the platform that we have been developing at FAO. It's called Infarm, International FAO AMR Monitoring Data Platform. Alejandro is uh, the, the colleague that is leading this work. And uh, it's a complex work, as you can imagine, with all the struggles that it means collecting AMR data at the global level. But it's, it's making progress. Uh, and that, that's the important thing. And uh, it's pushing as much as possible. And we are pushing as much as possible to make it a reality in the near future. And all of this, and uh, at some point, probably you have heard about this, even the course or before, we lead to the TISA, the Tripartite Integrated Surveillance System for AMR and MU. So this will be a, a global platform initially to display. So it will not allow initially the, the integrated analysis of all these different sources of data. This sounds easy to say or sounds easy to do, but it's, it's very complex to, the, to the, do global databases. If any of you has done data collection from the field level is aware of the struggles, putting that together at the global level, it comes with some, some complexities. So it's, it's again, good challenges and uh, that uh, we are dealing with. And the multi-partner trust fund did fund the development of TISA. So it will be a reality and uh, hopefully with the contribution of the three main organizations to, to, for data for TISA platform. Now, switching gears a little bit from the work that we will be doing at uh, FAO, I joined FAO about three months ago, and I received a welcome gift that I was very pleased to receive. So it was about co-leading our objective one of the new action plan. And so this objective is all about increasing stakeholder awareness and engagement. So many of you will be, can be part of this uh, uh, objective one implementation and it, it's it's all about this understanding the perspectives and motivations where are the real barriers to change or barriers to change at change attitudes for example and then the awareness of the risk how do, do you do you move from being aware that amr is a risk into actions to prevent it or control it so this will be much of the work that i'll be co-leading for the next uh, five years we had a, a couple of positions open recently by the end of October. We, we did receive very good applications. So it's nice to put together the team that will put uh, the, that will really lead the actions on this. We know that awareness is not enough. Probably you have seen this. In, interesting enough, in different public health uh, issues, for example, uh, obesity, I think, is always one that I like to make the parallel between AMR and obesity. We know what we should not eat, but still, it's too tempting to eat the good stuff. So we still eat it, even if we are aware that we shouldn't necessarily always eat it. It's about the same thing sometimes on, on AMR and AMU. We are aware of the things that uh, we should do and not do, but it's still too tricky to change the habits that, uh, that we, we do. So to understand further down, another example of interventions are these CAP studies that uh, have been um, developing knowledge, attitudes, and practices that we've been developing in most, some, mostly in African countries. And my colleague, Mark Caudle, has been uh, doing a lot of this work, doing sur uh, surveys in local uh, communities to understand this. The exact, I think the, the name summarizes well, knowledge, attitude, and practices related to AMR. So he has been doing really excellent work in these countries and uh, some of the results I put it here. Some of the countries are these, Kenya, Tanzania, Zimbabwe, um, Zambia, and Ghana. And the results are not that surprising 
I would say. But it's good to move from an adotto uh, result into actual having data collected at the field level. And so you see that the majority of respondents are never rarely getting input from an animal health professional, which is not that surprising. I started working in Portugal as a clinician about 20 years ago, and that was the reality 20 years ago in the, the country before the, the major investments in education. And so they get advice from family or uh, friends, the neighbor. The neighbor recommends this, so I use it because the neighbor said it's a good uh, drug, for example. Also, in terms of prescriptions, again, it's the importance of policies. Many of the policies, like the codex standards, I just mentioned them, the task force, the code of practice very clearly says that, or the, the, that we need a prescription for different classes of antimicrobials. But still, if you go to the field, you see that man, much of the, many of the antimicrobials can be bought without a prescription. So we knew this. It's still good to have the data proving it. And it's a good motivation to find out the ways to implement the standards that I just uh, mentioned uh, recently. And so we'll move into this, the studying of nudges. And uh, we, we might be familiar with this from different sciences. Political science uses this, behavior economics uses this. Is these simple reminders that uh, trigger us to, to change attitudes. For example, instead of, if you have a reminder of how many kilocalories you burn when you go up the stairs instead of taking the lift, it's a good incentive to take the stairs. You see there on the top picture on the left, if you are reminded of the deforestation consequences of using two toilet towels instead of one, then you might be uh, refrained immediately for taking two and you only take one. So these are, for example, if you see there on the bottom right, if you have a reminder that if you put something on the floor on the street, it will kill fishes or it will lead to the ocean, then you might be more careful and put it on the trash bin. So these are some of the things, the concepts that we have learned from different sciences that hopefully we will um, be able to implement related to antimicrobial use and AMR. And we have tools, lots of tools, and not in the FAO. Oh, I think the, the, the organizations, the tripartite and UNEP have been quite good developing tools that uh, allow us to assess a country. And for example, Atlas is one of them, is focusing on, on laboratories and AMR surveillance systems. The OIES PVS, for example, FAO as the PMP, all of these are very important tools to assess a country, to see where the country is, to identify gaps, and to make a plan for the, 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 to fill in these gaps. So these tools are, are, are valid until a certain point, the assessment point. Then it needs to find a plan to, and resources to find the, the, the solutions. Some of the work that we'll be doing is also facing this. When you think about food, and we just had the coffee break, so I think that the, I miss those coffee breaks, the meetings that we had, these, these cookies and the coffee, I miss those. They are great because when I think about food, I think about pleasure and I think about satisfaction. We are privileged enough to live in, in most of our days. We have food security. Most of the places that we go, we have food security. But food has a different story for all of us. If I were there in the room and I ask each one of you, what does food mean to you? It means different things to different people. So this is, but in general, it's something that is a mechanical thing that brings satisfaction, I think. This is my, my, my concept. When I think about food, I think about this. And I also think about in friend, inviting friends over to my house to have a, a good time with them. So this is what comes to my mind about food. But when I think about the AMR, it's a much more abstract concept. It's a microbiological thing that is somehow mysterious. I get the gene and then I will somehow maybe potentially express the resistance. It's too far, for, even for me, with all these medical uh, trainings, education that I had. So to explain to the consumer, it's also tricky. So we, we want to make sure, well, very clearly, we don't want to spread panic or fear or paranoia. That, that never helps. But at the moment, I do think that these two worlds are too far. We think about food as an immediate pleasure thing. And AMR is something that potentially can happen in the future. And therefore, the, the way we act facing these two things is very different. And again, we don't want to spread fear or panic. We just want to make sure that we are aware that these two um, worlds can be connected and the distance is not that far. Also, I think this is the core uh, uh, of what we need to, to, to understand as, as a scientific, all of us, the willingness to change. We know like we get a million reminders of the climate crisis all the time. So we, and we get a million reminders of the significance of AMR. Are we willing to change? The, the practices. So are farmers willing to change the practices? Most of the things that I've seen that lead to change 
uh, are mostly policy oriented or uh, economical oriented. If a farmer gets a penalty for doing this or that, then they change. If the policy restricts them to using a, a specific class of antimicrobials, then they stop. But it's usually, I don't think it's, it's um, an internal motivation to change. So I discussed with the is there with you uh, a few weeks ago, if it would be useful to do this, to do the genetic profile of farms, and then you change policies, you change, stop using this or that class or those classes, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then you do again, the genetic profiling of uh, the, the farm, the farm in the global sense, the animals, the farmers, the environment, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. To make a point in the sense, if you change practices, these matters to your health and the health of the beloved ones, the closest ones to you. So this would be interesting to, I think, to analyze. This kind of interventional longitudinal studies, I think we miss a lot. We, we need to implement a lot of these uh, studies. The long hanging fruit, I think most of it, we have uh, taken as much as we could, the easy one, the easier ones. And this, this kind of, these are similar ones, intervention longi longitudinal studies are needed. So again, like I discussed with Yap, if some of you are interested in exploring this idea, I'd like to discuss with you. And again, nothing is written in stone. This is for the next five years and we can develop something that we, we are both parts are interested in. And we just had, we are about to sign a letter of, of agreements with the groups of economic uh, behavioral economists, economists. So to understand the consumer perspective or even the retailer perspective in this sense, if you ask the consumer, do you care about where the food is produced or how it is produced, most consumers say, absolutely. Oh my God, absolutely. I care, I respect the environment, absolutely. And then in blind studies, above 90% of our purchase at the supermarket, me included, is based on the price. We tend to buy the cheapest and we ignore all the, when asked, we say, absolutely. I respect the origin, the way of production, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But if it's a blind study, then we'll buy the cheapest. So we want to understand how much are we willing to pay for food that would be, and then it gets philosophical, uh, uh, technical, how we define food with less AMR, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But that's complex. But the, the, the concept is how much are we willing to pay both the retailer and the consumers for food that hopefully would mean less AMR in the future. So this is about the studies that we are about to conduct for the next years, five years. And a final note before I conclude, uh, much of the work will be focusing on youth as well, reaching out to children, reaching out to kids, spreading these messages of health and spreading these messages of the, the common good, the connections between climate uh, crisis and antimicrobials, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So this is one of the examples that we are promoting, the One Health Youth Art Constant Contest and the One Health Youth Dialogue. So you have there the information. You, of course, have all these slides and uh, information. So uh, reach out to for maybe for your own kids, maybe for the colleagues, maybe for your students, and uh, spread this message. I think it's a good way to, to, to spread this, the, the news. And uh, the prize is an FAO internship with us. So that I think it's a, a good opportunity to visit Rome and get to know FAO better. So that's it from my side. Thank you very much for your attention. And I think we have some hope, some time for, for discussion. Thank you very much.